Hello everybody, welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry, my pup's name is Sunny, and each week we talk with a different therapy dog team around the world to hear a little bit more about their journey and learn more about therapy dogs along the way. If you are just getting started as a therapy dog and not really sure where to start, we put together a free guide for you that you can check out at freeguide.therapydogtalk.com. I am really looking forward to today's guest. They have quite a bit of experience in some pretty cool areas and hopefully a lot of cool stories to share with us. No pressure. Hi. Hello. How are you? Not too bad. Well, I'm so glad that you can make it today. For those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself and your pups? I'm Monica Callahan and I have five dogs. Two of them are current therapy dogs. One is retired. He was my actually my first one. He will be 12 next month. And then we have one who is eight and a half months. And I'm hoping so far so good that around a year when he's old enough, he can test and become one. So my two active ones are Oreo and Quint. They're Dalmatians. Hi. The retired guy is a Dalmatian named Doc. And then Hip Hop is the puppy. And okay. then we have two who, uh, I just wasn't sure she would be a great therapy dog. So she never tested or anything like that, but he's showing signs. So gotcha. What was it about her that made you think it maybe wasn't the right path for her? So she's super lovable. She loves a ton of people, but every so often there's one person that just kind of doesn't look right to her. I don't really know. And so they're wind sprites. So they are sight hounds, but they have a little bit of shelty in them. So she will give what I call that nice shelty bark occasionally at someone <laughs> and just kind of backs away and barks and I'm like well so <laughs> gotcha. and she hasn't done it in a long time so you know that maturity they mature a little late so she's four yeah. now so it might be something she might do down the road but I didn't think she was ready when she was younger so yeah no it's important to recognize that that's why I was curious kind of mm -hmm. what first the signs were with her you obviously have quite a bit of experience um <laughs> in, in recognizing whether or not your dogs are a good fit for it how did you originally find out about therapy dogs so I was going to school for pre-vet and biology and got my two Dalmatians while we were in college and so the first one I had I was kind of training on my own and I went to a trainer who I didn't necessarily always agree with but I just wanted to be in a class so we kind of did our own thing. But when I got Doc, he was my second one. I was like, okay, I don't really care how far I have to drive. I want someone that also aligns with the way I think so that I can get better doing what I'm doing. And so I found my, I guess you could call her my mentor. Lori was about an hour away. So we started going to see her and she was active in therapy dogs with TD Inc. at the time and before we changed. And so she kind of got us into therapy dog work. And then she actually got on to the board. I think she might have got on in 2015. So when the opening came in 2017, she was like, hey, you should apply. So I did. That's great. I definitely want to circle back to that and talk to you a little bit about what inspired you to join the board other than your invitation. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I know from having joined boards before, like that's a big undertaking. Like there mm -hmm. can be a lot that's associated with that. So definitely I like to bring that up. So you found out about therapy dogs after you already had doc, you said, right? Yeah. And that's your therapy dog that's retired from the work? Yep. So okay. he probably was eight, nine months when she had started kind of mentioning therapy dog work, which is sad because my original Dalmatian I had, I got when I was 12. I had always wanted a dog. My parents are not dog people. They're like, we're not doing it. But I finally convinced them. And my brother's girlfriend's parents at the time were getting rid of a three-year-old Dalmatian. So I convinced them. They let me get her. She was phenomenal. She would have been a phenomenal therapy dog. So I only wish I knew about it then but we lost her in 2000 probably would have been nine because I got Delta my other Dalmatian not too long after her and then Doc about a year later okay yep. all right well you know I'm sure she was freelancing without you knowing what exactly therapy dogs were <laughs> exactly <laughs> the world needs those freelancing dogs too <laughs> so you got Doc without knowing about therapy dogs what was it about Doc that really made you think yeah this is a good thing that we should get into together he was always 
very laid back. So my female that I had loved to work. So she was always just go, go, go. She might do a drive by with someone, but then she was like, okay, mom, what are we doing next? Where Doc was a lot more willing to just kind of hang out. And at the time, he really did really well with kids. And so okay. he just had that kind of more tempered down personality. And so it was just something I thought that he would excel at because he seemed to want to stick around a little longer and kind of make those connections where Delta, who I did have do therapy work towards the end of her life, but I tailored where we visited to where I thought she would excel. Awesome. And Doc, you said, has retired from therapy dog work, yeah? Mm -hmm. yep. How did you know it was time to let him step down from that role? So I actually retired him pretty early, mostly because he did have some dog reactivity. I started to notice that even if we weren't visiting with dogs, he was more worried about making sure there weren't other dogs around because they made him nervous than getting those interactions with people. So I just at that point felt it wasn't fair to him to keep having him do that if he wasn't enjoying it as much anymore. That makes sense. Yeah. Plus we had <laughs> kids, so he was doing really good when I was really training with him a lot. And then once I had kids, that kind of went down a little bit. So I take full responsibility. Adding more more puppies to the mix. <laughs> right. Awesome. So Doc has been a therapy dog. So is Delta, but Delta has passed, you said. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But now you have Oreo, Quint, who are currently therapy dogs, Hip Hop, who is maybe going to be a therapy dog, <laughs> Doc, who was, and who else do you have right now? Disco. She's and it's Hip Hop mom. All right. So we had a litter with her and my daughter begged and begged, she's nine, to have a puppy. And she does phenomenal training with her doing stuff with Disco. So we let her keep a puppy. That's how we ended up with hip hop. My hope is that by the time she turns 12 and can be a junior handler, those two are really set to go and they'll do lots of good work. <laughs> awesome. That sounds yeah. like a good plan. All right. So you have a whole crew over there. Is there yeah. anything that really surprised you in training along the way with any of the crew? Well, Quint is deaf. So he, okay. I've always wanted to adopt a deaf dog to work with. It's been interesting working with him. I don't necessarily think any of his weird quirks he has are because he's deaf. We rescued him from a rescue that grabbed him from a puppy mill. They were going to kill him because he was deaf, so he was four months old. It's been interesting working with that in terms of, he's been relatively easy in the grand scheme of things. He just is a very, like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go do it, and consequences and things come afterwards. So I always tell people he's the dog who, if they went to go jump a fence and, like, got stuck on it and got hurt, he would still try to do it the next time. Like, it, it didn't matter to him. <laughs> he doesn't think about those things after the fact. So I think that's always been interesting. But for the most part, I mean, Oreo took to it perfectly. She has been amazing. Hip Hop has actually, he has been an interesting one because while we were raising him, he seemed to always be the one who wanted to engage the most. And so I always had my eye on him from day one. When all the puppies went home, he all of a sudden got nervous of people. So around nine, 10 weeks, he got nervous of people. He would be interested in them in public and kind of stare at them and be interested in what they're doing, but he did not want them to approach him at all. So I just kept him back. And I, if people asked, I would just say, hey, you know, it's up to him. I don't think he'll come to you, but you can try. And people actually did really well about letting him choose if he wanted to or not. And most of the time he did not. He just kind of stared at them and they'd be like, oh, cute puppy and kind of walk on. And then about six months old, I'd say, it was like night and day. One day we went somewhere and he let someone pet him. And then from then on, he's been super into people touching him. He's very sweet about it. And he will kind of do that nice little sight hound lean into them and puts his little pointy head in their hands. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> so yeah, it was hard for me because we naturally want to push dogs into things that we think that they should feel comfortable with. Instead, I just said, no, you're fine to sit back and watch if you want to, and you don't have to say hi. And I think that helped build his confidence. Definitely. And especially your relationship, because he knew he could mm -hmm. trust you to not mm -hmm. force him into situations that he just wasn't ready for. Yep. Yeah, that's such a huge part of it. At what point then did you end up deciding to become a tester and server for Alliance? That one I don't remember much. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been doing it forever. You know what it was? Lori ended up moving to Utah. So we were from Ohio. We both lived in Ohio. 
she actually, when I moved and was training dogs, she was still about an hour and a half away from me, but she would come in and do like workshops and then she'd come and do testing every so often. But when she went and moved to Utah, we literally had no ATD testers in the Cleveland area. And I was like, nope, we can't have that. You know, I want to see us keep growing here. So I went and tested when I left there because I'm in South Carolina now. I know we had at least one other TO. I don't know if we've gotten a second yet, but we have quite a few along the border. It's really growing in the Cleveland area, and I'm quite happy to see that. That's awesome. Sounds yeah. like you're a big part of that, keeping it going. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> From your time as a TO and just experience as a handler with many different dogs, what's your advice for someone who's interested in getting started as a therapy dog team? I would say if you can, if you know someone, it helps to actually come and shadow visits with dogs that are already therapy dogs or if you know if you can find the local TO you can actually ask to observe their testing that they do just to kind of get a feel for it asking a ton of questions is helpful there's never really a dumb question we get a lot of questions about where can I visit and how do I visit and all that and so it might not always come out of our mouths because we have a lot of other things we're thinking about but I always am glad when people ask questions so that's always a good thing but kind of getting in touch with someone that can kind of show you the ropes because I know that was a big help for me when I started getting to see Lori do her visits and things like that without me having to worry about my own dog tagging along at that time. Yeah, I hear that. It can be a lot to take it all in for yourself for the first time at the same time as managing your dogs taking it in for the first time, especially if you're someone who's prone to nerves or anxiety in new situations because your dogs feel that and they feed off of that. For sure. Yeah. So Lori, then she's the one that invited you to join the board. When that yes. Time okay. Well, she told me to apply. They still <laughs> all had to agree to let me on. <laughs> right. But it sounded like she was a pretty strong voice of recommendation there. Oh, yeah. What inspired you then to go ahead and apply to join the board? Making a difference and kind of having a hand and hopefully steering where I think ATD should go. Because I know at the time and still now we're looking to grow, but we want to do it to where we can still have those relationships with our teams. So we're not just becoming some big organization that doesn't actually have those relationships with people still. And so kind of helping them. And I also knew that most of our board hopefully none of them hear this, we're a little bit on the older side. <laughs> and so I thought it would probably be a good idea to get somebody on their younger, which I mean, most of our members usually are a little bit older, mostly because they're retired and they have the time. But I think we're slowly starting to see that kind of turn and getting a lot of younger people in. And so I was hoping that I could kind of help that, help bring us a little bit more into the modern social media, things like that. And so. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a really good point because it takes, you know, that diversity of ages to really know how to appeal to and grow a diverse age range of mm -hmm. handlers. Yeah. What is your role on the board if you're allowed to share? <laughs> this year, what am I doing? I am on the Grievance and Ethics Committee. And so people always feel like that's a bad thing, but really a lot of it is just, you know, if we get complaints, just talking to people and trying to give them the knowledge of, hey, this is actually how it should be handled, or this is the rule, you know, can we help you understand it? So we're not always there to just get people in trouble. <laughs> you know, we want to educate. A big thing with us going forward is education and trying to get as much as we can out there because we want our teams to be safe. We want them to be covered by our insurance. So that's a big part for us. So I'm also on the social media slash PR committee. So right now I'm pretty much the only person running Instagram. And then Lori and I are kind of tag teaming Facebook right now. And so that's kind of building content for that and stuff. So that's been a lot of fun. And then PR. So if we get any conferences that we attend and things like that, I'm kind of in charge of making sure all that goes smoothly. Those might be the only ones I'm not. They're busy. So I probably interacted with you more than I even knew already. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I don't want to hold you here forever because it definitely sounds like you have a lot on your plate with the uh, five dogs, let alone everything else. But is there anything else that you wanted to share here? Anything that stands out to you about your experience with therapy dogs that you'd like for people to know? I would say just a big thing of, you know, if you don't know where to visit or if you think there's a really good spot to visit, but they're not yet into visiting with dogs yet, don't be afraid to continue.
continue trying to do it and it will eventually happen. So in Cleveland, I tried a couple times. Now I wasn't as tenacious as I could have been about it, but they wanted nothing to do with an airport program. And that was something that was always near and dear to my heart that I wanted to do. I pretty much kind of grew up at the airport because both my parents worked there. So the idea always, I loved it, but they didn't want any. And so when we moved to Myrtle Beach, I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And so I finally, it takes courage to contact people and be like, this is what we do. Do you want it? And to help them. But, you know, they said it was in the summer. So they're like, we're really busy in the summer. because Everyone comes here in the summer. And so they're like, contact us in the fall when we're a little less busy. So I did that and they were all for it. So don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there. If you have places that you think would be fun to visit and they don't have anything started yet, because you can really be surprised, I think, on, you know, what you can build if you try a little bit. I love that. I'm so glad you brought that up too, because it completely escapes my mind to bring up the Myrtle <laughs> Beach Airport program. And actually, Jared Wadley, who I'm sure you know, is oh, commenting yeah. <laughs> free here, asking how challenging it was to get the airport program started and how many teams are involved. So I was super lucky in that Myrtle Beach was super easy to get started. Apparently, I learned recently that they, right before COVID, had brought in a couple teams with I believe love on a leash and then once COVID hit they stopped that and so I think I just came in at the right time right after COVID was kind of settling down a little bit and said hey yeah. every airport is different I have talked to quite a few people and they're like we do this and we do this and those are not the same so it really just depends on how your airport wants to handle it like I know Charleston they don't go beyond security but with us they didn't want us in baggage because that's where the bomb sniffing dog is so mm. we were told we have to go past security I mean every airport is kind of different in terms of what you need we had to do background and security and all that to get that access right now I think we're up to I think we have six dogs we have one that I think he was the fire chief for the airport just retired and he wants to start doing it with his dog so that'll be seven so my husband and I do it with Quentin Oreo and then we have another Dalmatian, a Yorkie, a Golden, and a Pekingese. That's a that's... big variation. I know. I know. I it's that. really fun. Yeah. <laughs> so often people ask that what's a good breed to work with as a therapy dog? And uh, there's so many different scenarios that different dogs are good for. So I always love to see a diverse mix of breeds. Uh -huh. I've actually noticed that a lot of the airport programs in the United States anyway work with Alliance of Therapy Dogs. Do you all have a group where the organizers of the airport programs kind of collaborate or? I don't think so. I don't necessarily know why that's the case. I know LAX <laughs> started them all and they're all ATD. That's just kind of traveled through. Yeah, but I've noticed that too, that a lot of airport dogs are ATD. Yeah, we've had quite a few different airport dogs on Therapy Dog Talk and all of them have been ATD. So it's just a trend that I noticed. <laughs> right. Well, I know a couple that aren't ATD. <laughs> Oh, one last thing I'd like to ask, just because the breed question reminded me, this is the first time I've talked to Dalmatian therapy dogs. Oh, yeah? Not that I'm talking to your dog, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Are there any breed-specific things that you've run into on working with Dalmatians as therapy dogs? I definitely think they are a breed that, like, if the dog is going to be good at therapy work, it's good at therapy work. Otherwise, they're kind of like, meh. They're originally bred to be guard dogs for the horses when they were kept in the stables. So even with Oreo, who is really, really good at the work, when we weren't doing it often because of COVID, because she got tested right a little bit before COVID, Quinn got tested in COVID, when we weren't routinely doing visits, every so often there'd be someone she was kind of like, I don't know. And she would get over it pretty quickly, but you could just tell that she was a little like, I don't know. And I think that's a really breed specific thing. That's what they're bred to do is to wonder if that person's supposed to be here or not. <laughs> but now that we do weekly visits to the airport and all the fire stuff and everything, and I told my husband this the other, it's been a while since I've seen her. So I definitely think, you know, there are certain breeds that need to have that consistent exposure to visits to consistently stay comfortable with it. And I've noticed that in my dogs. It's like they need that consistency where maybe if you pull out another dog, you know, it might be fine. So I definitely think Dalmatians are really good at it. When you have a dog who's going to be good at it, you know it with a Dalmatian. There are ones who I don't think would be that good at it. Surprisingly, though, all of mine that I've had so far would have been. 
And so I think a lot of it is early exposure and training too, and making them, you know, get that exposure to lots of different people and things. Very cool. All right. Well, that's all for me. Is there anything else that you would like to share? I don't think so. This was fun. <laughs> Thanks. I think so too. I'm really glad that you could join us. So thank you Good. so much for doing so. And if anyone wants to follow along on your journeys, they can find you at the.hero.dogs, right? Yep. That's us. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. It was really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.